Hey, Wire Monkeys. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Cabling. This episode, we're talking about cable combing. Should you do it or should you not do it? So welcome to the show where we tackle a tough question submitted by installers, estimators, project managers, ICT personnel, where we are connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube, would you mind hitting the bell button and the subscribe button to be notified when new content is being produced? If you're listening to us on one of the audio podcast platforms, would you mind leaving us a five-star rating? Those simple little steps helps us take on the algorithm so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of people in the ICT industry. Thursday nights, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? You know I do a live stream, right? I do it on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, where you get to ask your favorite RCDD, and you know that's me, questions about installation, certification, estimation, project management. I even do career path questions. But I can hear you now. But Chuck, I'm driving my truck at 6 p.m. on Thursdays. I don't want to crash and get into an accident. Not a problem. I got you covered. They're recorded, and you can find them at letstalkcabling.com. And finally, while this show is free and will always remain free, if you find value in this content, would you mind clicking on that QR code right there? You can buy me a cup of coffee. You can even schedule a 15-minute one-on-one call with me, after hours, of course. And you also can visit our Amazon link page on the webpage where you can see the tools and stuff that we recommend, and then I'll make a small stipend off that. You won't pay more but I'll make a small commission. on All that stuff goes back in helping pay for the podcast. On this episode, I wanted to address cable combing. This is a, one of those topics that almost always starts an argument on the internet. Not that it takes a whole lot to start an argument on the internet nowadays, but you want to start an argument, it's, it's, it's to use Velcro or tie wrap, that's one. Union or non-union, that's another. And then the third one is, should you cable comb or not cable comb because technicians are opinionated about it. Now, I know I've got my feelings on it, but I wanted to bring in a fellow subject matter expert on this. So I want to welcome to the show, first time, Mr. Henry Frank. Henry, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Chuck. Thank you. And there's actually a fourth way to start an argument. Because do you know what RCDD really stands for? Really can't do diddly? Nope. Royal Canadian Donut Design. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't like As a Canadian. That's what we called it. Yeah. I don't like the really can't do diddly because it kind of downplays the RCDD, but, but I've heard lots of them over the years, but uh, I've never heard the donut one, the donut design. I like that one. Oh yeah. Well, you know, you, you can't throw a stone in Canada without hitting the Tim Hortons. So <laughs> that's a fact. That's a fact. I've been to Canada a couple of times. I've, I've been up here to teach classes. Um, I've done classes in Toronto. Um, I even went to a small little town called Smith Falls or Smith's Falls or some yep. some little mining town. It only had like one hotel in the whole entire place. <laughs> so yep. it was a pretty interesting place. I, I, I love teaching up there. I just don't like coming back to the U.S. because when I'm coming back, I've got my black pelican cases loaded up with gear. Mm -hmm. And you would think that I was on the 10 most wanted list, you know, coming back in with all the kind of gear, you know. Yes, sir. Ah, it is what it is. So for the people who may not know you, Henry, why don't you go ahead and give yourself an introduction. Tell us who you are, um, how you got in this industry, who you work for, so we, we can build some credibility. Yeah, absolutely. So Henry Frank, and you know, right now my day job is with Belden, and I'm the Smart Building Solutions um, Consulting Team Leader for the Americas. So if you're working with us and working with my team, um, you know, that, that, that's who I work for as my day job. But then the company is also gracious enough to uh, sponsor me to participate in industry standards. Uh, my background is much like yours, Chuck. You and I both started out in the field. Um, I started out in the 80s uh, after leaving university. I started being an installer and worked my way up. Um, uh, through in the in, uh, throughout the industry into different jobs. Every time somebody said, do you want to try this? The answer was yes. Um, so I encourage everybody that's listening, you know, especially if you're an installer, 
try something. And if you like it, do it. And if you don't, keep doing what you're doing. That's fine. Uh, but keep growing, keep learning. Um, and back in the late 90s, I was really interested about industrial networks and how they were evolving. And, you know, I saw Ethernet and, and structured cabling hanging over the world. So I, I became part of standards. And uh, I've made that uh, part of my day job. So the, the company supports me. So I'm the chair of the TIA uh, TR42 st Engineering Standards Committee. So whenever you hear people talking about, you know, 568 for uh, generic cabling or 942 for data centers or 1179 for healthcare, that's those engineering committees. Much like Bixie has the, the committees for the RCAD and for its standards, the Telecommunications Industry Association also has a, a group of engineers that uh, create standards. And so I participate in that. And the reason I do is because even though I work for a vendor, I don't know how to make a cable. I don't know how to make a fiber or a copper cable. I look at it from the customer perspective and I've always found that was something that was missing in standards. So I asked them to uh, continue to support my work there so I could represent uh, the same people that you're serving, Chuck, the, 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 the builders of these networks, the designers of these networks and the users of these networks. So. That's my background. Nice. I've been doing nice. This so you must run in the same plus. circles as Jonathan Jew. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Jonathan Jew is a precious resource of our organization. Uh, and there will be a collective outcry. It's sort of, you know, we'll hear a disturbance in the force if and when he ever retires. And I just have to force him to retire later than me. So that <laughs> it doesn't bother me too much. Uh, because he is the editor of so many documents and contributes so heavily. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, he's uh, a lot of times. I've got a complete set of the copy of the uh, the TI standards. I'm, the podcast bought them. I've got them here, and uh, and and uh, you know, the finding some. It's funny because I've read the standards, but sometimes somebody will ask me a question about the standards. I'm like, I know I've read that, and then and then trying to find it because I don't have I have it in print form, not in not in uh, PDF file. So it's kind of harder to find it in print form. So Jonathan Jew is my go to. I usually shoot a message, hey. Um, I know the standard says this, but where does it say that again? I mean, literally, well, like within 20 minutes, boom, I got a response back from him. And he's like, oh, here it is. And he's just, he is just, this industry, like you said, and when he retires, this industry is going to take a hit. It, it really will. And, and this industry is built upon the backs of people that give back. Yes. This is part of what I love about this industry. I mean, you and I and Jonathan and, and guys like Ray Amplett, who, who sadly passed away this year, were people that built this industry through School of Hard Knocks. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was really in its infancy in the 80s and 90s uh, as we all did this. And it requires that continued investment and commitment and that community right. that I don't think it exists really anywhere else. So. For those of you listening, you know, please participate, you know, whether it's Bixie, TIA, or however you can. Um, you're in a great industry, and the more you give the industry, the more the industry is going to give back right. to you. Yeah, one of the things I like to tell people all the time, and I usually do I usually I, I usually do this when Jonathan's on the show. You know, I usually yeah. tell people, look, you don't have to be a PhD in electronics. You just have to have a a a, a, a giving heart. To want to give this all because there's some there, I guarantee you there's some part of experience that you've got to that you can go to this group and you can bring that valuable information. You don't have to be a subject matter expert. You don't have to be an RCDD. You don't have to have that you know like I said that PhD. You just have to have the, the heart to serve. And yeah. and and from serving on committees, I've I've never served on a standards committee, but I've served on a a couple Bixi committees. You know, um, and one of the things I learned pretty quickly is it's like free training. You learn a lot yeah. of stuff, and how do you calculate? How do you calculate the? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You can tell it's first show of the year because I don't have all the words in my head right yeah. now. Um, how can you calculate the benefit? There it is. How can you calculate the benefit of all the relationships that you build from that from those committee meetings? And I'm glad you 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 brought up relationships because you know people will look. Um, you know, like I expanded, you know, I talked about my team earlier, like I expanded my team, I doubled my team and people said, hey, you know, we want to hire, you know, hire more people. Can we get another you? It's like, you're never going to get another me. 
no one is ever going to be able to replace Chuck right. or Bob or Anna or Rita or Christy or whoever is in your team because we're some of our experience and expertise and that's all different, but it's that relationship word that you keyed in on is when I first, and don't let this ever scare you away from participating in Bixie or NECA or any industry organization. At first you're going to be overwhelmed and you're going to say, Oh my God, there, there's all these people that are smarter than me. And that was my, certainly my first reaction. And then you're going to realize we all put our pants on one leg at a time. Yep. They're not really any smarter than you. They might have more experience than you. And they might have more expertise than you, but the way they get that is through their relationships. Right. So the value that a person like you bring, Chuck, or, or, or myself to the, my organization and my colleagues isn't with what I know, it's with the relationship networks. Right. You know, like you said, it's like, uh, it, it, it's like phone a friend, you know, I got to phone Jonathan. Um, and, and again, you know, Ray Emplett was, there's only so much room on my desktop and I'm not a grounding and bonding expert. So as soon as something grounding and bonding shows up on my desktop, it gets pushed off, you know, uh, <laughs> quicker rather than later. But then particip participating in standards is like, okay, I know who Mark Harger is. I know who Ray Emplett is. I can phone them and get an answer or email them or text them or whatever. And that's really the, the, the benefit of participation and community. I, I, I hope we never lose that spirit because there, there, there's too many things that are nuanced, like our discussion about combing, where if you just read the available literature online, I talk about a knowledge hierarchy. We talk about big data. Well, data is only ones and zeros, and then it becomes information. And then you have to take it from data to information, to knowledge, to wisdom, and you add context. And you know, that is more forward looking, you know, the data is more historical, uh, backwards facing, and you need to be able to filter it. You may have some great Google Kung Fu, but if you don't understand the contents and the nuance, sometimes it'll lead to the wrong direction. Right? I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. And before I get before I keen on that, I want to say, I'm glad to know that I wasn't the only one who felt intimidated the first time I sat in them committee meetings. I'm, I'm looking at these guys and these are, industry titans because yeah. you know I've, I've seen them around bixie conference and stuff and they're kind of like almost like the the rock stars and stuff and i'm like i'm in the same room with these guys you know yeah. and you do you learn you learn you learn so much you learn so much and it's it's absolutely a great thing to do and you you know you mentioned about like bonding and grounding you know it, that is kind of one of my one of my fortes I, i'm not gonna say okay. I'm, I'm a i'm not a i'm not a bonding and grounding engineer but I have a lot of experience in, I was a volunteer firefighter for about five years. So safety is really one of my key things. So fire stopping and bonding and grounding. So I'm really fluent with what the standards say to do and when you should do it and all this stuff. Although I'm still trying to find somebody to come on the show to, to explain at a technician level, not an engineer level, okay. ground loops, what they are and how do you find them? How do they, because that's that's one of those gray nebulous areas in our industry that everybody says, well, that's going to cause a ground loop. And, you know, I've had, I've talked to engineers offline and they're like, yeah, that's not a ground loop. That's not a ground loop. So, well, bad news and good news, bad news, bad news for you. Good news for me is I have no clue on how to explain that. <laughs> Remember ground, bonding, grounding off my desktop. Good news is, and, and again, this is, highlights the importance of relationship. I do have a couple names, so I'll follow up with you. And before I out them, uh, you know, live on camera, I'll. I'll yeah, yeah, sure yeah. Don't I, don't call the names out here, just in case, because yeah. you know it's it's. I, I found that a lot of people are willing to come on this show. Um, the the biggest fear that they usually have is they think that they're going to be talking to a large group of people, and yes, you will be talking to a large group of people, but recorded. <laughs> I'm really good at editing, right? So I, I'm. You meet me in person. You know, if you ever see me walk around a Big C conference, I am nowhere near as articulate as I am on the podcast because I'm really good at video editing. <laughs> you know, right? And and people like you and I will never be company spokes people. Right. We'll never be marketing experts. Right. But I hope that we all have credibility because we're earnest. Yeah. 
we may misspeak, we may use colloquialisms, we may drop the, uh, the occasional expletive, <laughs> but I think that shows a candor yes. as opposed to pandering. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so I love to make fun of marketing people um, <laughs> when I make my speeches and say, I'm not going to be perfect. Yep. Far from it. But that's okay. Uh, I don't need to work in marketing. I work in the real world. There you go. We're, we're where the rubber meets the road. So you wrote a – Yeah, and and, you, and, they, they, and hopefully marketing people never – in my organization never watch my presentations when I say that because otherwise they'd be grossly offended <laughs> because it's another valuable skill that I just don't have. Yeah. So you had mentioned uh, earlier – about how the information changes and stuff. And hmm. and this is why I wanted to, I, I don't remember how I came across your article. You must have, you must have posted it on LinkedIn. And then, yep. cause I don't remember if you and I were friends before I reached out to you or not. I don't remember, but somehow it popped up in my feed. And yeah, we were con connections, but hadn't talked a lot. And it, and it probably popped up in your feed because there's a lot of tribal knowledge that we're losing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 that's why I like you know how long ago did you write that article? Just out of curiosity, you remember? I think it was sometime last year, okay. but it's been something that's so I have a whole laundry list of these articles that I'm working on with marketing's help and our professional writer to clean up my language. But it's been a sore point for years because there's a lot of myth and misconceptions in our industry about guidelines. Yes. Uh, you talk about the fight zip ties versus Velcro. Use zip ties if you want. Use stainless steel zip ties that you sharpen the edges if you want. Just make sure you don't over cinch them and just make sure that they're not on a bend so they don't disturb right. or cut the jacket. Right. Now, considering they have sharp edges and sharpening them would make it more difficult, you'd have to ask your question, why in the heck would you want to? But there's always going to be a place almost, for them, though. There's always going to be a place for them. Um, yeah. You know, especially if, like, you're, you're retire wrapping, like, introduct or, or maybe some high pair count, backbone cabling, stuff like that. And a lot of technicians, their their preference is to use tie wraps in the cable tray on the floor, but then use Velcro in the telecom rooms. Yeah. And, like, and that's, you're right, that's another thing. But what I was, what I was tying into was, and this just kind of shows you why our industry is so confused. Right. Yes. There was, an, and this is kind of what keep key me in. Like when I saw this post, and I can't remember where I saw the post. It was on. I want to say it was Facebook, Thank but you. I can't say it. But somebody said, "Look, Fluke says you should randomize your cable." Fluke, a well-known company in our industry. You know, they're considered thought leaders, and I don't get me wrong. Fluke's a great company. They got a lot of great engineers, and so I went. And I oh, luckily the guy put the link in there, and I went and looked at the link. The article was from like 2009. Yep. Dude, that that's old news. That's old news. You got you got to be careful when, especially with our industry when you look up information, when was it published? Yes. When was it published? And what was the context? So alien crosstalk has always been an issue. But we've never defined it, we've never quantified it, we've never created the guidance around it like we did until we came to category 6A. Is crosstalk or alien crosstalk from one cable to another cable instead of between pairs, sorry to waggle my fingers at you, it's always been an issue. Mm -hmm. But it became a bigger issue when we got to category 6A because we were trying to do 10 gig signals, um, which, you know, the, the closer to the edge that you go, there, there, there's the smaller margin for error, if you look at it that way, including crosstalk. An alien crosstalk, which again is between uh, adjacent cables. Right. And so I always loved combed cables. It's a statement you know, of pride in your workmanship. Ex that is exactly why. Because if I see a nicely combed job and a neatly done job, I'm almost guaranteed that it's going to be done right and then it's going to work because somebody took pride yes. in their installation. Yes. So for people that are old like you and I, um, like thick wire Ethernet, um, where you had – if you have a really old building, you might see this yellow thick wire Ethernet cable about the size of your thumb. Every you thumb a thick net? 
Oh yeah. Okay. Every couple meters, you'll see a black band. Yep, that's thick we net. And uh, we had a guy that was so good when you used, remember you used to put your thick wire in a telecom room. You had to loop it. Yep. He figured out how to make the Olympic rings, and he had a a, a system of doing it. So those black rings where you'd put the transceivers with the vampire taps would be on the bottom of all the Olympic rings. Nice. And so you knew as soon as you walked in that he was eliminating chances for error, right. eliminating chances for things to be done incorrectly. And because he took pride in workmanship and pride in ownership, the customer was satisfied. And that's the same reason I'll say, you know, skip to the end, comb your cables. If you want to take pride in your workmanship, yeah. do it. Not saying that having things loosely arranged isn't appropriate sometimes. You know, if I'm doing something, and again, I'll use the example of like a temporary sporting event where, you know, I'm going to go in one day and out the next. Not that it should be a randomized rat's nest, but you don't necessarily have to have it combed. Right. But if I see something combed, I know somebody took pride of ownership. And again, it's not an issue for alien crosstalk with a caveat. So if you're dealing with a reputable manufacturer, any of the ones that you can name off the top of your head, the top 10 manufacturers or, yes. you know, whatever manufacturers, top five or top 10 manufacturers in the Americas, you will not have a problem with alien crosstalk. Because what we do is, as, as manufacturers, when you're designing a cable, you have engineers that do it. Engineers always work to the worst case. When you build a building, you, you know, in Canada, you worry about snow load. So you calculate what's the most amount of snow. You might have 20 feet of snow on your roof. So let's calculate the snow load for 20 feet of snow. Using the analogy of alien crosstalk where you have, you know, your, your, your victim cable and then your aggressor cable doing signaling. Um, and, I, and I can't give you a, I don't have enough fingers to do the, the, the six around one. But if you look at a honeycomb, a honeycomb is arranged in a six around one scenario. Mm -hmm. You have your center cable, and then there's the six cables around. So you would have six aggressor and one victim in the middle. That's the worst case for alien crossing. Right. Because we don't know how things are going to be done in the field, because there's variabilities in the field, you know, uh, your cables get bent, the geometry gets changed, you might be installing next to lights or power cables or anything else, we always have to take the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. So a reputable manufacturer, again, any of the top list, We'll go and um, test everything in a six around one configuration for a full 100 meter channel, well, 90 meter permanent link, um, where what we do is, uh, because I've seen it in the lab and I've seen our setup and I've seen other people's setups because you see it when they do, when they give the testing and standards, is they go six around one and then they go and tape it up either with, uh, uh, like a mesh uh, grip or they tape it or tie wrap it every meter for the 90 meters. And then they test for alien crosstalk just to make sure it's not a problem. So that's what the manufacturers do. The myth around not doing that is because A, you don't always have reputable manufacturers. So some of the offshore stuff, some of the really weird, um, you know, hey, I, I can find it for $1.99 on Google type stuff. Amazon, Amazon's got Cat 6A for $32 a thousand feet. Yeah. <laughs> you get um, what you pay for. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and you see some of the things and the, they can't even spell category right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, which is a dead giveaway. So go to the CCCA website, CCCA, so three C's and an A. Um, that, that, that's a group of manufacturers. It's an industry organization like Big C or TIA, but not as well known, but they come up with a lot of content about this and they talk about counterfeits and sticks. But again, while we were all doing the testing, while we were developing the cables, if you remember your physics 101 from high school, you know, you have your right-handed rule and hopefully my camera's flipped. So it's showing the right-handed rule. Otherwise it looks like I'm holding up my left-handed, uh, uh, my left fist, which is what not to do. So if any of you are taking electricity and magnetism and you're right-handed, put your pencil down when you're doing your test because then otherwise, instead of doing the right-handed rule, you'll do the left and that's how you'll fail E and M the first time like I did. But if you remember your high school physics, the worst case for 
interference is conductors in parallel. Right. The best case is conductors perpendicular. And that's where that guidance came about randomization. So the best thing you can do is not have things in parallel. So the reason that guidance came out is because um, in category 6A, the A stands for nothing. It doesn't stand for anything at all. It's another myth that we can talk about. People will call it augmented cat six, uh, which it's which it's not. But when we were testing cat six for higher speeds, we noticed the problem of alien crosstalk. And they said, what's going on? Well, with poorly designed cables, this is going into the engineering behind it, it's it's balanced between the pairs. So the difference between a four conductor cable waggling my fingers at you and a two-pair cable, they're both four conductor cables, but only a two-pair cable, or in the case of our category cable, a four-pair cable, is because there's balance between the pairs. That's why you'll see different twists on blue, orange, green, and brown. And you'll see different recipes, depending on the manufacturer, depending, depending on the part number, they have different recipes, just like a chocolate cake. You have a thousand different chocolate cake recipes, they're all chocolate cake. But they do that, they have different twist lays, different ways of twisting it per inch, more or less, you know, clockwise or anti-clockwise to keep the randomization going. And that's why we do all this testing. But when you have all those neatly clombed, you know, historical cables in a tray, Cat 5E, Cat 6, which weren't tested for alien crosstalk, we had a how to augment your cable plant if you have to go beyond one gig and things like you know swapping out your your connectivity or higher grade of connectivity or randomizing the bundles so instead of having them all neatly combed just have them all sort of randomization so you don't have the parallel effect on them. Uh, and so that became because that was published in a tsb because the the final document wasn't ready it became a rule and that myth just kept growing and growing and growing and this is why participation in standards or in Bixi or your industry organization is important because anybody can read it in a book. We could create an iPhone app for the Bixi TDM. We could create an iPhone app for the um, TIA family of standards. But there's all the context that's missing. It's not just what's in there, but why things aren't or how things get in there. So once we did the testing, any reputable manufacturer can go six around one because we have to offer warranties around that for that full 90 meters. So as far as I'm concerned, comb your cables. It shows pride in workmanship. It'll get, you know, you as a technician called back to a job so long as you're not, you know, finally combing it, you know, right. <laughs> like combing the desert using that old um, space balls analogy. As long as you're not like, taking too long, they're going to call you back because it shows pride in your work. You're going to have better yields. The thing's going to work right the first time because you're taking pride in your work. And because you're taking pride in your work, your customers are going to want you back. Your partners are going to want you back. Um, you know, if you want to go to the ultimate version of combing, uh, you know, do a search for lacing cables. Yes. The telcos used to do this with lacing threads, and it was a skill. I couldn't do it. Yeah, look up, it. look up. Um... Sean Rep, uh, Sean Rep's all yeah. over social media. He, that guy is a cable dressing artist. Even in my best day, I was only half as good yeah. as him. And uh, yeah. he, I mean, you could you could put for those who don't know what cable combing is, it's just a practice of bundling your cable. So literally, where you can put your finger in any one of the cables on the outside bundle, and then follow it all the way down, all the way across the rack, all the way down the panel. There's none diving in and out and all this stuff. And what I wanted to add to that was. If somebody's if somebody's paying that attention to detail to something as simple as dressing a cable, then you know what the important stuff, the testing, the terminations, you know those are going to be done right because they paid the attention to details to the small details. And there are some companies, I've, I've like you said, I've, I've got a lot of installation experience. There are some customers out there who are early adopters of technology and stuff like that, but they also mm -hmm. like to have the best of the best and they're willing to pay extra for that beautifully cable comb job that's that's another right. argument you get into some people argue about is why why spend all that extra time why not just throw it in there yeah. okay but but chuck let's turn that around 
I want the customer that wants it home because they realize it has value. Mm -hmm. And if they realize they have value, they're willing to pay for a good contractor instead of the, again, the, the myth and misconception of two bobs in a truck. Because you can be a small outfit and still do really great work. Some of the best yes. outfits I know are small outfits, essentially a, you know, a two bob in a truck. But, you know, if you're doing good work and a customer doesn't want to pay for that good work, it also works in reverse. Yes. So, you know, from a customer perspective, seeing good workmanship should attract you to them, should make you want them want to keep you. By the same token, if you're working for a customer that just says, slap it in, I don't care, just throw it in, you know, put, you know, why do I not want to put a wiring closet in a janitor's closet above the sink? Yes. You know, if they don't care, they're not going to value your work or your craft nope. or your skill or your experience. Nope. So, you know, th th those are the people where you're always going to have to win the race to the bottom. Well, you know, somebody's going to do it for $200 a drop, and then it's going to be $199, $198, and so on. And as they keep Googling, that, that you're just going to have to keep winning the race to the bottom every time because they don't value quality. Until you find that two bobs in a truck, it'll do it for a hundred and a quarter run. Yeah. Or yeah, we we I, I don't know if the, I don't know if you guys have this term now this term up in uh, up in Canada, but down here in the U.S. we call them trunk slammers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and we 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 when I used to be a technician, one of our biggest competitors were trunk slammers, uh, and they they did piecework. So you know at the time it was you know it was showing my age because not only was it you know in the nineteen it was in the nineteen hundreds it was the last century of the last <laughs> millennium. Uh, they were putting in drops for like 15 bucks a drop, 20 bucks a drop for labor. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say, ah, oh, well, you know, it's like 15 bucks a drop. You know, we'll do, we'll do anything. And they were, they had, they were always hiring and they always had ads in there. And again, you know, when you see those trunk slammers out there, the, 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 the those piece work type guys, it's a great conversation with your client too, because it's, it's sort of a win fast, lose fast. They said, well, you know, how come you can't compete with, you know, company X? Cause company X says they'll do every drop for $15. I was like, okay, well, here's the newspaper article for, again, showing my age, the newspaper article with the ad for labor company X is looking for installers. We pay minimum wage, no experience necessary. It's like, okay, is, is this who you want, Mr. Customer? Like seriously, you know, and, and, and maybe, there was a myth that data was a convenience or a nice to have. Oh, it's a requirement uh, nowadays. Email. But data is becoming absolutely mission. Like they talk about mission critical systems and everybody goes to, you know, um, uh, data centers right away. Mm -hmm. But if I'm a hospital, when I'm on that hospital bed, that, that really, you know, stealing from Monty Python, the most expensive machine, the machine that's supposed to go bing, bing Better go bing when I'm on the freaking table. Oh, uh, you're you. I'm a huge Monty Python fan, and yeah. my wife isn't. And I, I tell her all the time: there are two types of people in this world: Monty Python fans and the people who just don't get it. And I, yeah. I say that all the time. Every wrong. time I get in an elevator, I always say, "Quick, get the machine that goes bing." <laughs> yeah. As soon as I'm in a hospital, I use that, and I use that analogy with people. But it's absolutely mission critical. Yeah. It's like. How many people, like, okay, you have convenience Wi-Fi in a hotel. But I guarantee you, if you go to that hotel and that Wi-Fi doesn't work, you're either looking for another room yep. at the very least, or for sure you're going to be never going into that hotel again. Or not using that chain ever again. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So it's, it's, not, it's not convenient. You know, like, when a, when a retail store loses its point of sale because everything's now connected to the cloud. Um, they shut down because they can't work in yes. isolation. And, right? and, and how so, do you, how do, how would a company factor in how much money they lose because a network went down? How, how do they factor in the replacing that lost data? How do they factor in, the human labor it's going to take to regenerate that data again. And then these are, right. these are, these are critical things that can happen if you don't pay attention to the details. Yes. And it can and cause this, problems in the long run. Right. And, th and this is why that quality of workmanship is important. And it's not just for, 
things like combing and alien crosstalk, which is why we, we created it. Because there's another myth around combing that's not a alien crosstalk related. Um, but if you hear about things like uh, limited power, mm -hmm. limited power was just a way of marketing people to create fear, uncertainty, and doubt. To say, oh my God, what happens if, you know, my, my, and sorry for using my sarcasm voice, what happens if, oh my God, I'm using power over this cable. It's going to melt and it's going to start a fire. It's like, well, wait a minute. That's not going to be the cable's fault. What happens if your toaster fries out? You blow the breaker. You know, if I go to any wire in my house and take my snips and cut it, what happens? A, I get shocked because I'm stupid. <laughs> but B, my house doesn't go on fire because I've tripped the breaker. Right. So this whole, so having the right cable for the right job is important. But this whole myth about, oh my God, limited power cable and power over Ethernet, things are going to go on fire. It's absolutely ridiculous. Right. We talk about 100 watts of power for a category cable. And they'll talk about loosely bundling things. Well, if you look at how the limited power requirements were taken care of, they did the same thing. They did six around one, and then I forget what the number is past that. So they just kept making the honeycomb, you know, you got one, and then you got the six around the one, and then the honeycomb gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then what you have to do is you have to tightly bundle that every meter for the full 90 meter channel, take your POE, run it at full power, okay? And um, because, you know, your devices have their power rating, say at 100 watts, but they don't draw anything close to that. You know, like most devices are, are still in the low single digits or low double digits for power consumption on average. And then you have to tightly bundle them together then put them in an environment with no airflow with a high ambient temperature. And then yes, you might have temperature rise that exceeds the recommendation of the manufacturer. The reason I'm saying it's not a problem is, is well before you get to the point where they're gonna melt or do anything else, the temperature gets so high that the ethernet part of the power over ethernet doesn't work. And as soon as ethernet yeah. doesn't work, the power it, cuts it, off. The insertion loss will go through the roof as soon as you start getting, uh, start getting hot. Um, exactly. The only time it's a problem is if you take your category 6A cable, take all the whites and all the colors, twist them together, and replace them for an 18-gauge lamp cord. Because I know people are doing that every day. <laughs> and again, that's my sarcasm voice in there. So even with things like that, what you have to realize is that you know the worst place that you have for power, when you talk about bundling and, hey, you know, when, when TIA came out with their, their, their power over Ethernet, I said, you know, keep them loose, you know, keep them randomized, you know, don't bundle them too tight. Again, that's the engineers doing it from a six around one, and then, you know, just keeping the honeycomb getting bigger into, into your hundreds of cables, and then discovering a problem when every single one of those hundreds of cables is drawing full 100 watt power at you know, 30 degrees C ambient temperature and the temperature rise gets too high. It's like, is that really the case? When is the only time those cables are closely bundled together? So A, in a data center where you're not really using PoE anyway, but let's say something like a hospital or a university or a, a, a hospitality or stadium network. The only time they're really bundled that close together is for that, the, the, that short three to five meters while they're in the telecommunication space mm -hmm. that, by the way, is air conditioned. So you don't generally have that problem. You don't, when was the last time you went and grabbed the cable bundle? You go, like, oh, God, that's hot. That's at 40 degrees C, you know, I'm, I'm right. ready to burn my hand. You know, it, these things practically don't happen. People think about the worst case scenario, but the reality is, is I have my tight bundle of cable in the telecom room. And as soon as I go through that penetration, what happens? All my cables do this. Yep, they break the problem out. Goes away. Randomized, you know. But it, right. the good thing is, is if the, if you follow, that's why. Like you know, if you follow the rules, again, it's going to guarantee right. that that cable plant's going to work. Ninety nine, the, the old Dove commercials, ninety nine and forty four one hundredths <laughs> of a time. It's it's always going to work, right? And, and 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 let me ask you this: since you're since you're heavily involved in the standards, right? You know, you, know, you give your CMP LP, CMR LP. And they're actually even referenced in the standards. Uh, there's a table. There's a, a 725-144, I think it is, 
that says what's maximum bundle sizes for PoE. And it gives you the number of cables based on the conductor size and amperage and stuff like that. But it says in the verbiage that the table is null and void if you use LP cable. Right. And then you have to go to the manufacturer and, and, and look at their ratings. Uh, and I can't speak for all manufacturers because I work for one, but I don't <laughs> work for them all and I don't study them all. But I can, I can say, you know, from my own experience, from who I work for, when you look at the bundle size, it's like, okay, I'm not worried about it. Right. I rarely have bundle sizes that big. Right. And when I do, they're not all drawing power at the same time. Yeah, because some right. of the bundle sizes in, in the NEC are huge. And and I think the Bixie yeah. best practice, if I remember correctly, is 24 to a bundle, if I remember right. So that's that's still even far below than what the NEC oh, allows yeah. you to go up to. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, it, uh, I mean, when we did the, uh, again, because our engineers did the testing, and, and, and don't take this number as uh, as uh, as wrote. You can look it up on the website. I don't even know it. It's, it's one of those things that's absolutely trivial, so it goes off the desktop. But our numbers are for like a 6A cable for, for type 3 PoE, like three or 400 cables before you have a problem. Yeah. And I'm sure all the other, you know, top vendors out there in the Americas are the same. And it's like, it's just not an issue. Right. So, so again, this all comes back to combing it because if you're combing it, you're taking pride in your work. And then, and that's why you have that three nines, four nines, five nines reliability. Because if they take that much care in their, Dressing, they, they're going to take care of the termination. And if they're do, taking care of the termination, I'm, you know, assured that they're going to do the right uh, testing. And when it comes to, you know, again, alien crosstalk testing, just, and I'm circling back around to that topic, just because this is something I often get from technicians and contractors, Chuck, is they'll say, you know, vendor A, B, C, D, you know, through their warranty and certification program, they don't require testing for alien crosstalk. And that's true for those vendors, A, B, C, and D. But just because I, and this is the only, it's not a fight, but it, it's it's consternation for the contractors. They'll say, you don't want me to do alien crosstalk testing. It's like, no, I don't care because I've done worst case. But sometimes, again, people that don't know better write it into their specifications. Right. So if it's written in the construction specification, that you have to do alien crosstalk testing either in whole or in part. You're doing you're doing you're doing alien crosstalk testing. Is what you're doing. You, you're, you're stuck doing it yeah. now. If you want to go and use that as a value engineering option to say, hey, rather than me doing alien crosstalk testing, you know, reach out to a person like Chuck or myself or whoever your 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 your, your manufacturer's rep is. They'll probably write you a letter saying that you know we'll certify without testing it. But I would rather have you invest in in work instead of spending money on doing alien crosstalk testing. I'd rather have you invest money in doing the comb because then I know the pride of the ownership's there. Mm -hmm. So what changed in the cable? Because like I said, I know when Cat Six Eight first came out, you said um, there were, and I remember this too. I mean, there was a lot of manufacturers saying randomize, 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 and now now most manufacturers most manufacturers now will say, well, you can cable comb or randomize whichever you want to do. We're fine with it. So what changed yep. within the cable? It's still Cat Six Eight cable. It's it's people did all the testing. So that guidance came out and was a holdover from the TSB. And again, I forget the TSA, TSB is like TSB alphabet soup. I know it's a three digit letter. Whether it's one eighty four or whatever it is, we can we can look it up and put it in the notes later. It talked about testing for augmented testing procedures and troubleshooting procedures. Just like we did when, you know, so you and I are old enough to remember the category five to category five E. Often everybody just calls it category five, which isn't actually correct. It's actually five E. But you and I are old enough to remember when category five was a category and then five E was different. And we came, remember when we came up with those testing islands, like what happens if your cat five E system doesn't pass cat five E? What do you have to do? And there was, you know, Reduce the number of untwists on your termination. There was randomization of cables. There was try changing to new patch cords. Then the next step was try replacing the jacks. And then if that didn't work, then replace the cable. Which is absolutely ludicrous, but that's the way you have to think about it as an engineer. 
because no one's going to go through all that stuff and test it. And then go, hey, it didn't pass Cat 5e. Maybe I'm going to go and loosen all my bundles and test everything again. Well, that still didn't work, so I'm going to go and uh, replace all my patch ports and test it again. Oh, my God, that still didn't work. I'm going to go and replace it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, when yes. it doesn't pass, you're just going to replace it. Yep. And it, so it's absolutely nonsensical. <laughs> but God love engineers. And again, these guys are way, you know, to your point. Yep. You're going to be intimidated if you join these things because these people are way smarter than you ever will be. Yep. Um, like, the number of PhDs is, outnumbers the number of people in the room, for God's sake. Yeah, we, uh, we, we, uh, we definitely need more more field people, more installation people, yes. more project managers involved more in the standards More people community. to demand answers and demand that they write yes. for the audience. And it's not faulting the people with the PhDs that can figure out how to do the twist layers. It's just they've never been in the field, so they never had to worry about right. it. Right, and, and they don't get, and here's, here's the thing, right? I, I remember this because like, I, you know, I took a college class one time. Um, it was statistics. And even though I was an estimator, I was good with numbers. Uh, it, was, it was one of those one of those college classes where it was statistics 101, 102. So you had to take two of them back to back. And I remember yeah. halfway through the first class, I'm like, I'm going to fail this class. Because the yeah. teacher was not teaching. He was teaching at the PhD level, not our level. Yeah. And I, it, was, it was just it was just going over my head, you know. Absolutely. So, so this is why that same thing came about. So it's like, hey, if we have category 5E or 6 systems and we want to go beyond a gigabit, what are we going to do? Right. And then because – because remember, Cat 6A came out and Cat 7 even before that. So we don't even talk – no, no, let's not, not talk about day. Cat 7 on this show. Well, that's, that's a different subject. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that's a discussion for another day. So that's like, uh, you know, Ron has a good uh, – blog on that why put a spoiler on a pinto <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly hey, i want to put mickeys on my pinto it's like okay you can but why the heck would you want to um uh and sorry guys you're gonna have to look up what mickey tires are and what a pinto pinto's. is <laughs> but so when we were developing cat 6a the 10 gig ieee interfaces didn't even exist Okay, they were starting to be developed, so we knew what they were, how they were going to start doing things, how they were going to start to do it, and we realized that alien crosstalk was going to be an issue. And we, you know, again, being hey, we have all these things that we have to worry about, so if I have to worry about alien crosstalk, I'm going to worry about alien crosstalk here, mm -hmm. even though the reality is here, just like we talked about with power, and so because the electronics weren't available. People overcompensated. So they came out with all these guidelines that included chain, you know, same things. It's like, you know, undo less twists, change your patch ports, change your connectors, right. change your cable. And before it was change your cable, it was randomize your cable. And then that suddenly just became a rule. Right. Right. And and, and again, when people were failing, um, and not faulting Fluke or, or Viavi or any of the, the, the testing manufacturers. But if you're testing and you fail, you have to try and find a way to pass. That's, that, that's the reality. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to try and go from least offensive to most offensive. So least offensive is if I can just randomize the cables and it works, okay, great. Uh, but, you know, if alien crosstalk, that's much of a problem. You know, the amount of... Uh, I've never seen it done on the field. I'd love to see some practical examples where, hey, I just randomized a bit and made the, the bundles a little loose and, and it worked out. It, it's just a historical thing where all of these guidelines came out, right. um, you know, b before there was even an application. And so it just became hallowed antiquity. The old man on the hill said this, and this is the, the you know, this is why, you know, you, what you're doing here, you know, the, the Bixi manuals, the Bixi committees, the TIA committees, the NECA committees, where it's actually people collaborating is important to participate in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I was saying earlier. That's why we need that's why we need more installers and project managers in there, because that way they can hold the engineers accountable in those conversations. Absolutely. Because that's who that's who the standards are geared towards. The standards aren't geared to other PhDs. The standards are for the project managers, the estimators, the installers in the field. And if they can't read and understand it because the PhDs are talking, you know, above them, 
then they're not even going to read the book. Yeah, I mean, look exactly. at the code book. And, and, How many people don't read the code book because it's written in legalese? And the code book, so, so again, we're talking about, we're going a little far, far afield, but I agree with everything you're saying. So this is why I, I, I still want to maintain my leadership of TIA for another couple of years, because I want us to change philosophically instead of writing for ourselves. It's like, so you have a bunch of manufacturers writing for themselves how to make their own cable. It's like, okay, well, you already know how to make your own cable. Your half of your standards or more are for somebody else. Learn how to write for the audience, and I got to get yes. us to do that. And so this is, and there's a bunch of us in standards that are doing the same thing. People nice. like you and me that may work for vendors, but we support contractors and and, and end users and, and engineers, and we're trying to do that. One of the things you mentioned in your article, and I hope you can can expand on this because I I would have thought it'd been the opposite, but uh, you, you were talking about um, the bundling, the six around one, and the length of the cable and stuff. But you, you said in there that. Um, many manufacturers can't pass a six round configuration with four connectors in a shortened channel. See, I would think that alien crosstalk would be a, be worse for longer distances. It'd be more likely to fail in longer. Distance. Why, why is it, why is a four connector channel failing in that shortened so 24 meter channel? It's not an alien problem at that point. And again, I'd have to get one of my engineers in there. It's a, a near end, far end issue. So short is an issue, long tends to not be an issue. Because you think of it as like, you know, you and I are literally thousands of miles apart, but think, imagine we're a hundred miles apart. If I'm shouting to you, you know, that's near it, that, that, that's the analogy for nearing cross ducts. So all of those people can hear that. But if, if I can shut out the people that are going like this, and then I'm listening for Chuck, I know, and, and so this is what the electronics does. It filters out that loud interference, for lack of a better word, right? That near end crosstalk, and it, fil it can filter it out, and the electronics always get better. So when we come up with the guidelines, we, we always plan for the worst, hope for the best, and the reality comes somewhere in the middle. But because you're always planning for the worst, that near end crosstalk, because it's my transmission pairs, you know, one, two, and seven, eight. You know, it's like, I know what this is transmitting. So if I start to hear interference going the pat pattern of my waggly fingers on these fingers, I know it's these guys. So I, I just ignore it. Um, and then it's far end is, you know, the same thing, the far end crosstalk. What happens is when channels get short, if you think about that, we're all shouting at each other. And so the the, the electronic compensation and cancellation, and this is where... I'll, I'll find you somebody much smarter than me if, if needed. But this is essentially what's happening is short is more difficult because you have all of those near and far end instances being almost at the same level and it's hard to distinguish. And by having a four connector channel that is uh, short, it gets even worse because then you get all those back reflections. So what so for the layperson might be listening to this show, what's what's your explanation of what a four connector channel is? Because I know a lot of people don't truly understand what that means. Right. And, and so a four connector channel, and the, there's a different way, a slightly different way of explaining it for fiber, but slightly different terms. But let's essentially look at it. It's not four connectors, right? It's four connecting connection matings. And you always exclude the equipment end and the equipment end. So if I'm going from server or switch to, to device, those connections where I'm plugging into my computer, I'm plugging into my switch, aren't included. But when I go from my patch cord, so I have a patch cord with a connector, another end plugged into the jack at the patch panel, that's one mated connection. And then assuming I have a cross connect, so I have an active to passive, where that other patch cord happens, that, that's your mated connection. So when you have a four connector topology, don't count up the number of connectors because you actually get more than that. Um, it's where the connectors mate, right? So you have a jack, in, in the case of, uh, of copper, you have a jack and a plug. So when a jack goes into a plug, that's one mated connection. So you can have four mated connections, excluding the ones on the outside in a channel. Fiber is slightly different because there is no plug and jack. 
there's just two connectors mating through an adapter. All right. So we always call it jacks or we call it couplers, but they're really adapters. It's a really weird terminology thing. Cop is, is, is this whole tribal thing, right? Yes. Oh, so yes. You, you're like either LIU versus fiber enclosure. Right. You're, you're cheering for the Bills or you're wrong. Right? <laughs> exactly. All the hate from, from anybody that's not a Bills fan. Uh, but I'm close to Buffalo, so I have to cheer for the Bills. Uh, and it's the same thing with copper and fiber guys. So, you, you know, it's getting less. I, 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 sorry, I was going to say it's getting less so, but it's it's not. It's always being competitive. So this is why you have fiber people and copper people. Um, they're like big brother, little brother. They're always going to fight. So this is why we have, you know, white, blue, blue, white, white, orange, orange, white, white, green, green, white. Mm -hmm. But we have a, a 12 fiber color code where green is repeated twice in fiber. And then if you go to the extended color code, there's like two more shades of green in there and they can't use tracers. And, if, you know, so the fiber guys make fun of the copper guys and they say, oh, my God, we're so much smarter than you. You're cavemen. <laughs> oh, my God, copper so old. They were using that in the 1800s. So oh, like, you're so you're right. Modern. You're so right. They, they, uh, they, they, um, the, the people who do fiber tend to look down on copper people. They, they absolutely do. Not all fiber absolutely. people. Absolutely. Not, not all but, fiber but, people. But there's a definite. No, 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 no. I'm saying is yeah. a, a generalization. Yeah. But then you got to go to the. the the best comeback for that, because I used to have a guy that used to joke like that. One of the product engineers was a fiber guy. He goes, I'd ask him copper question. He goes, I don't know. I'm not a caveman. It's like, oh, but you know what? Maybe, you know, as, a, as an ex-copper guy, you should listen to the cavemen every once in a while. Because copper guys are smart enough to figure out what type of cable it is, like category three, four, five, five, e, six, seven, eight, you know, outside plant we're smart enough to figure it out by reading a label we don't have to color code it exactly oh uh, i'm gonna use and that by one. the way we're smart enough that when we do color code things we don't have the same color for two different things so we don't have om1 and om2 both being orange and om3 and om4 both being aqua right you know we're real smart and it's just sort of hilarious it's it's that um that ego or the culture of the people that work together and you know, once we get beyond all these things, it becomes a lot of fun. And another one of the great reasons why to participate in these industry organizations, because the more you know, the the better off you're going to be yeah. in every part of your job. Yeah. I want to add on to what you were just saying is, you know, there, there's the, um, not the disconnect, but the, 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 between the copper and fiber, but we're also an industry of people who like to rav each other. We like yeah. all the time. So you had that layer on top of it. It gets, it can be kind of fun. So as a subject matter oh. expert in the industry and a person who heavily involved in the standards, should I cable comb or should I not cable comb? Absolutely you should. If it's gonna if it's gonna display pride and ownership, absolutely. Um if it's gonna be in a spot that no one's gonna notice and it's gonna be difficult to do, then don't bother. Make it neat and clean. I'm never gonna say not make it neat and clean. But if you're in a telecom room, you're in a data center, comb it. It's going to look better. Absolutely. Henry, what a great show. I didn't. I really didn't expect us to go this long on talking about cable yeah, coming. But, you know, we touched a lot of good stuff. And I got some ideas for some future stuff down the down the road that I'm going to have to have you come back on. We're going to have to talk more in depth about, man. Let's talk about pathway fill, buddy, because the contractors and the technicians are the most important folks out there. Pathway fill. And capacity calculation is one of the most misunderstood things in our industry. And I'm going to have to get some graphical things to help you with this. But somebody asked me for another quick blog on that. My rough notes was eight pages long of bullet notes on, on, on how to do this properly. <laughs> eight pages? Eight pages? Yep. Holy cow. Of, of, of things why this is important. And it was funny. The more initials people had on their name, the more I found they didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah. So when I had this issue, I had it with RCDDs who were also P engines and had been in the industry for 20 years. And I wanted to have their P engine RCDD revoked because some of the things that they were saying that they were, they were just like fun. It's like, you should not have the pride of that degree or that designation right. because you've got this information so wrong. I've got, I've, and then I found the, as I started rem removing honorifics, the information got more accurate. And the most accurate information I got was from the first year apprentices. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because they're fresh in it. Because they they're had fresh it. in it. 
school of hard knocks built yeah built right into them that's that's one of the common questions i see a lot on social media is how many cat six cables can i get through a one inch pipe um i need a little bit more information to give you the answer to that you know yeah. what size is the cable are you trying to go yeah. for a 40 percent fill or a 30 percent fill how many 90 degree bends are in it what's the length on it yeah. there's a lot of considerations it doesn't that's just one thing or, or the other That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.